Texas has their best start through 10 games since 2009. They are sitting at 9-1 and one after beating the TCU Horn Frogs 29-26 to 26 on the road on Saturday night. You are Locked On Longhorns, your daily podcast on the Texas Longhorns. Part of the Locked On Podcast Network, your team every day. Longhorns the show Jonathan Davis your host today's episode of locked on Longhorns is brought to you by game time download the game time app create an account and use code locked on college for $20 off your first purchase survive in advance survive in advance Texas is now nine and one after beating TCU on the road this past Saturday 29 to 26 we discuss everything that needs to be discussed from Texas ninth win of the season. We also got a pleasant surprise yesterday. Wardell Mack, who had committed to the Florida Gators back in August, flipped his commitment to the Texas Longhorns yesterday. We discussed that in the second segment, and it's Monday, so you know the third segment is the Big 12 Roundup. Everything you need to know regarding your least favorite conference that happened outside of the University of Texas over the weekend. All of that and more on today's episode of Locked On Longhorns, part of the Locked On Podcast Network, your team every day. <laughs> Survive in advance, <laughs> survive in advance. It's been such a roller coaster uh, watching this Texas football team this year, watching this team for the first time um, in over a decade really have, you know, legitimate national championship aspirations. And for the first time in over a decade, look like legitimate uh, Big 12 championship contenders. And, you know, now you're at that point of the season where it doesn't matter how it looks. You just have to win games, right? And you have to keep finding a way to stack these wins week in and week out. And for Texas fans, there's a ton of anxiety because we feel like we're watching a really good team, right? We feel like we're watching one of the best teams in the country, but we also feel like we're watching a team who we're hoping their best football shows up next week, right? Because we haven't seen it yet. So um, it's been a lot of highs and it's definitely been some lows over the past four weeks, but the most important part is your 4-0 in your last four games and all of your goals are still in front of you. Um, when we talk about this Texas football team, you know, as they've done really uh, for the majority of the season, they jumped on their opponent in the first half, right? And really going into the fourth quarter against this TCU football team, Texas led the game 26 to six, right? And then we had that, oh, sh here we go again moment, right? Because it ended up being a three point game after you lost the fourth quarter by 17 points. But nonetheless, over 60 minutes, you made enough plays to win that game. And like I said, at this point, it's all about surviving and advancing and doing what it takes to get to the Big 12 championship game and hopefully creating a good enough resume to be one of the top four teams that ends up in the college football playoff at the end of the season. One of my takeaways from the game on Saturday or my biggest takeaway is that it was refreshing to see us use our playmakers down the field. That's something that we have done at times, but we haven't done it consistently. And we definitely haven't seen it too often in a game where Adonai Mitchell and Xavier Worthy are both utilized down the field in the same game right and we had started to see Adonai Mitchell really turn up you know the last two weeks under Malik Murphy and so we felt like when Quinn Ewers came back that we would be able to see you know that continued production from Adonai Mitchell down the field in the passing game while also seeing that chemistry that we know that Quinn Ewers and Xavier Worthy have kind of come back because Xavier Worthy's numbers did dip a little bit uh, when Malik Murphy when Malik Murphy became the starting quarterback due to Quinn Ewers injury well, on Saturday, we saw Adonai Mitchell and Xavier Worthy both utilized down the field, and it was a welcome sight to see, even in Quinn Ewers' first game back, that he was able to push the ball down the field. We first saw the interception, which I'll talk about here in a minute because it was an amazing play by Jordan Whittington. Um, we first saw the interception down the field, you know, targeting Xavier Worthy on a deep pass, but he came right back to it uh, two plays later. You know, and he's being guarded by one of the best cover corners in the country. And Josh Newton uh, was pretty decent coverage, right? Xavier Worthy just ran past him and Quinn Ewers was able to put it on him, you know, drop it in the bucket. And you're able to complete that pass for 45 yards, right? There were some times in the game where you targeted, you know, Adonai Mitchell down the field and you just weren't on the same page, you know, between Quinn Ewers and, and Adonai Mitchell. But it was good to see him get those opportunities down the field. Xavier Worthy still caught a bunch of screens, but you were able – to throw passes to him in the intermediate and deep parts of the field when he got one-on-one -on -one coverage and was winning against that coverage against Josh Newton. And then, of course, Adonai Mitchell uh, made the biggest play of the game, catching that ball at the end where Quinn Ewers threw a spot, and he did a hell of a job adjusting to it and, you know, catching the ball and calling game essentially against TCU with them not getting the ball back. So when you look at it, Xavier Worthy, 
had 10 catches for 137 yards. Adonai Mitchell had three catches for 61 yards. That was 198 combined receiving yards. That was their second best combined output this season, right? Outside of 17 catches for 234 yards against Kansas. They did have 197 combined yards against Kansas State last week. So that's two weeks in a row that they put together a really good effort. But we both know, I mean, we know that these are two top 10 receivers in the country, right? We said that coming into the season, coming into the season, we expected to have one of the most explosive passing offenses in the country. Both of these receivers in Worthy and Mitchell are capable of going for 200 yards by themselves, right, every week. So it's kind of crazy to me that through 10 games, they've only combined for 200 receiving yards once. But like I said, the last two games, 197 and 198 combined receiving yards, I know that they've been open every week down the field. We just haven't utilized them down the field every week. But hopefully for the remaining parts of the season, we can utilize Xavier Worthy and Adonai Mitchell, two of the 10 best receivers in the country, and they need to be utilized every game the way that they were utilized this past Saturday. Now, Jordan Whittington is also a very talented receiver, and we have not done a good job this season at all getting the ball in his hands. And unfortunately for somebody who means uh, so much to this team and came back to have a bigger role, <laughs> right? He did not have a catch on Saturday, but he still made his mark making one of the biggest plays of the game, which ultimately might have won you the game down the road. So with 222 left in the first quarter, Quinn Ewers throws a deep pass that was intercepted by Millard Bradford. And I have no problem um, with this interception by Quinn Ewers. You know, like I said, I want to see us push the ball down the field more and utilize our playmakers down the field more, right? A consequence of that is going to be throwing interceptions. So I was not upset that Quinn Ewers threw that interception because I was happy and proud of the offense and proud of the fact that we were pushing the ball down the field. And like I said, if you throw the ball down the field a bunch, that's going to be a consequence. So he threw an interception. We bounced back, ultimately won the game. I had no problem with it, right? Quinn throws a deep pass that was intercepted by Millard Bradford all the way at the TCU 24, right? He starts returning this ball, and Jordan Whittington is the first contact made on Millard Bradford by a Texas, I guess, defender at that point, even though they're playing on offense. Jordan Whittington missed a tackle on Millard Bradford at the TCU 36. Now put yourself in Jordan Whittington's shoes, right? He is a player on this football team that's running probably 30, 40 routes a game. He's never getting the ball. He's all the way down the field. He just missed a tackle, right? On a player that intercepted a ball targeted for Xavier Worthy. He's laying on the ground. What 99% of people would do in that situation is continue to lay on the ground and say, I try, right? While Millard Bradford is running down the field, in route to a possible pick six. But Jordan Whittington is built different, literally. Not even to be cliche, he is just built different. And in that moment, he got up off the turf and continued to chase Miller Bradford because the play was not over. And the result of Jordan Whittington getting up in that moment, the result of Jordan Whittington being built different in that moment and saying, you know what, I just missed this tackle on a, a play in a target that was not even meant for me all the way down the field. But I look up and I see him still running, right, trying to score. So I'm going to get up off the turf. And even though I may not get to him, even though this may be an effort in futility, I am going to hustle down the field to try to make this tackle. And because of that, he was able to run down the field, strip the ball 30 yards down the field at the Texas 38-yard line. Xavier Worthy recovers it. And even though Quinn Ewers throws an interception, Texas gets the ball back and only loses three yards of field position because Jordan Whittington, who missed a tackle on the TCU side of the field, got back up off the turf, ran to the other side of the field and forced a fumble and gave the ball right back to Quinn Ewers. Texas ended up scoring three points on that drive, right? A drive where they threw an interception and Texas ended up winning the game by three points. So even though Jordan Whittington did not have a catch in this game, even though Jordan Whittington has been criminally underutilized on offense this year he still found a way to make one of the biggest plays in this game one of the biggest plays of our season on Saturday so that's just a testament to who Jordan Whittington is that's a testament to literally him being built different and what type of football player he is and then I saw on Twitter after the game even though he did not have a catch right he was talking about how Texas fans needed to stop complaining so much because we were nine and one we were nine and one and he hasn't been nine and one since high school so talk about just a team first player somebody that can make a play like that in that moment and somebody who can still be excited and happy for this football team after the game when he didn't have a single catch. And I don't even remember if he had a target or not. So, you know, we talk about team first players all the time and, and you know, players that love this university and love 
uh, to put on for the University of Texas and his fan base and the burnt orange and white. And I'm not sure that there's a player on this football team that embodies that more than Jordan Whittington. I had to just get in my soapbox real quick and talk about that, because like I said, he is criminally criminally underutilized on offense by Steve Sarkeesian. He does not get any passes thrown his way and still found a way to make one of the biggest plays of the game on Saturday, one of the biggest plays in a special season for the 2023 Longhorns. A quick word from our sponsors, and then we get into more of the conversation about Texas and TCU on Saturday, specifically talking about the defense. Today's episode of Locked on Longhorns is brought to you by Game Time. Game Time is the only ticketing app that gives you complete peace of mind with your purchase. You can see the view from your seat before you buy, so you know exactly what to expect when you arrive. All in prices show your total up front, so you know you're getting a great deal without hidden fees. You can buy tickets in seconds with just two taps. Take the guesswork out of buying tickets with Game Time. Download the Game Time app, create an account, and use code Locked On College for twenty dollars off your first purchase. Terms apply. Again. Create an account and redeem code Locked On College for twenty dollars off. Download Game Time today. Last minute tickets, lowest price guaranteed. All right. So coming into the season, I remember in uh, fall camp, Steve Sarkeesian talked about an emphasis on the defensive side of the ball were sacks and turnovers. Right. Last year we got a lot of pressures, but that didn't turn into a lot of sacks. And last year we were around the ball a lot, but <laughs> we didn't turn that. We didn't always turn those opportunities into turnovers, right? And those are the things that take good teams to great teams and take great teams to elite teams, right? Because, you know, I've said the last couple of weeks on the show, when you get a sack on the opposing quarterback, their chances of continuing that drive decrease significantly, right? So sacks get you off the field. And then, of course, turnovers gives your offense, which is one of the best in the country, extra opportunities and turnovers are the great equalizer, right? Typically, more often than not, I would say, you know, probably seven to eight times out of 10, the team that wins the turnover battle is going to win the game, right? So sacks and turnovers are really important. And I think four straight games with an interception doesn't happen on accident and really had a chance to be five, maybe even more than that, because I remember Jaron Thompson dropped the interception in the end zone against Dylan Gabriel. But nonetheless, since then, four straight games with an interception, that's really good from our defense. And like I said, that doesn't happen on accident. And now you're tied for 21st in the country with 11 interceptions there's like 11 teams in the country that have 11 interceptions so you could either end up in the the top 20 or end up outside of the top 40 to end the season but nonetheless a huge turnaround um, from this texas football team in terms of getting their hands on the ball and giving extra opportunities to our offense and when you look at it you've had five interception over five interceptions over the last four games which is hilarious because they've all been by terrence brooks and michael taff <laughs> but you still have five interceptions over the last four games three of those games being one possession wins right so when you talk about about beating U of H by only seven points. When you talk about uh, beating Kansas State by only three points, when you talk about beating TCU by only three points, those interceptions and turnovers gets magnified, right? And like I said, you know, getting those many interceptions over the last four games doesn't happen on accident. So um, really excited to see, you know, something that, they made a priority coming into the season, come to fruition on the field. This Texas football team has done a really good job over the last four games in terms of getting their hands on the ball. And like I said, when three of those games have been won by a combined margin of 13 points, then you have to say that these interceptions have gone a long way to making sure that Texas keeps their Big 12 championship and college football playoff hopes alive. So shout out to Terrence Brooks and Michael Taft for getting five interceptions over the last four games. And hopefully the rest of the secondary can join the party. Another reason that this Texas football team is nine and one and um, off to their best start since 2009 is this Texas defense is second in the country, allowing a 26.5 percent conversion rate. Right. So teams are only converting essentially let's round up 27 percent of their third downs, which is really good. Second in the country, only behind Utah. And we know that's a scrappy physical group who's probably going to lead, you know, or be at the top in that uh metric every year but when you look at it this is a huge turnaround for the texas defense because even as good as they were last year right even when we felt like we started to see flashes of a really good defense at the 40 acres led by pete kakowski and gary patterson right i'll give him his credit as well we still were a really bad team on third down right we were 94th in the country out of like 133 teams allowing a 41.3 conversion rate on third down right and the game that kind of is burned in my head or sticks in my craw last year is the game against Texas Tech, right? Where I think they converted 11 
third slash fourth down right in that game. It might have been even more. It might have been like 17. I might be underselling them. But like I said, that was a huge problem for this Texas defense last year, as good as they were in the Alabama game, right? As good as they were in the TCU game, this team could not get off the field on third downs. And we saw that right in those two losses against Oklahoma State and Texas Tech, where you blew double digit halftime leads. But this year, this team has been absolutely dominant on third down. Once again, holding teams to a 26.5% conversion rate compared to 41.3% last year. Last year, we were 94th in the country. This year, you are second in the country. And what that has done is that has won, you know, obviously, um, put teams in a situation opposing teams where they're not scoring on the majority of their drives Two, it's put more pressure on opposing teams offenses teams have had to attempt 22 fourth downs which is one of the highest marks in the country um, against this Texas defense in just 10 games right so teams have gone for it 22 times on fourth downs in just 10 games against the Longhorns right that's because you've been so good on third down and of course our offense can put a ton more pressure on you and because you're forcing you know offenses to make ill-advised decisions right you know not converting third downs having to go for it a bunch more on fourth downs that's giving your offense shorter fields and more opportunities to score points and then just turns around and puts even more pressure on the opposing offense later in the game so one of the biggest reasons that Texas is on a four game winning streak we know that the defense has been really good at stopping the run and um, you know stopping teams on third down which has been a huge key for them the last four games also getting turnovers and sacks three sacks the last two games each right and then five interceptions over the last four games has been a huge part of this turnaround for this texas defense and this texas football team overall so uh it hasn't always looked pretty and it's definitely not going to look pretty going against these teams that hate you and want to beat you on the way out of the big 12 but at this point texas is undoubtedly one of the seven or eight best teams in the country and you have to continue to control what you can control, which is going out and winning football games each week. Of course, you would like to, you know, be a little bit more impressive in these wins. You would like to put a little bit more style points on the board, you know, especially when you may have an uphill battle now to get into the college football playoff. But it's tough to go out there and beat football teams for 60 minutes. And this Texas football team, even though it hasn't been pretty, has found a way to do that the last four weeks. So salute to them. Nine and one is not easy. It's a hell of an accomplishment. Being a Big 12 championship contender this late in the season is a hell of an accomplishment. We should know we haven't done it since 2000. 2009 or we haven't won it since 2009 i should say and then being a college football playoff contender this late in the season is a hell of an accomplishment we should know because this is the first time right this is uncharted territory for the texas longhorn so um i guess maybe outside of 2018 but yeah right this is uncharted territory for the texas longhorn so uh enjoy it <laughs> right grasp it in um don't take it for granted and let's be iowa state next saturday all right Speaking of um, this Texas football team, the latest member, the newest commitment, uh, Wardo Mac. This was a pleasant surprise yesterday while I was watching uh, the Dallas Cowboys beat up on the New York Giants. Right. My Cowboys are now six and three on the season, although those th really three losses to the Cardinals, 49ers and Eagles mean a lot more than the six wins up until this point. So we're kind of in that wait and see mode with the Dallas Cowboys do uh, in the playoffs. I'm just rambling right now. But Wardell Mack, 5'11", 170 pounds. This is a huge pickup from the staff. You can never have enough players uh, at the cornerback position. Uh, we see this year we've done a lot of rotation with Gavin Holmes, Malik Muhammad, um, Austin Jordan, Jalen Gilbo. I've gotten a lot of snaps uh this year of course some of that was brian watts being injured but i think we do a lot of rotation at the safety and corner position so you know that helps you in recruiting right you can you know tell these high profile corners that hey whether you're the fourth fifth or sixth corner on the depth chart you're going to get a lot of playing time right and obviously you know a player like wardell mack you're hoping he can step in and be one of those top three corners for you because he certainly um, has the talent level to do so. 5'11", 170 pounds can add uh, weight to that frame. Uh, 247 sports composite. He is the 129th player nationally, uh, the 12th player at the cornerback position, and he is the fourth overall player in the state of Louisiana. And we know the state of Louisiana breeds some of the best talent in the country. And typically, you know, my whole life, these type of players have gone to LSU. So uh, credit to Terry Joseph and uh, the rest of the defensive staff for going into uh, Louisiana and getting Wardell Mack. And I think it's even harder to flip, you know, a player that's committed to a school like the University of Florida. They may not have the success on the field, but that's still one of the biggest brands in the sport. So uh, definitely shout out to the staff for, you know, going in there and uh, flipping Wardell Mack from the University of Florida to come to uh, the University of Texas. And he had been committed to Florida since August 14th. So, 
you know, certainly that's why they say recruit through the whistle, <laughs> you know, and um, you go out there and win games because that's the best recruiting pitch you can make. Right. Go into a school where you have a chance to win a national championship. And Texas certainly looks like they're ahead in that regard of the University of Florida at this moment. When you look at the scouting report on Wardell Mack, this is on 24 seven sports website projects as a high major DB prospect who could become a multi year multi year starter in route to NFL draft candidacy. So, you know, hopefully if he shows up and, you know, shows out at the University of Texas, he can be a forever Longhorn in the NFL. Now, with the addition of Wardell Mack and uh, Ryan Wingo a couple of weeks ago, you now have the ninth overall recruiting class. And if you can add Kobe Black, who has looked like a lean to the Longhorns for a very long time at that corner position, then you can have a really corner, a really good corner class, excuse me, in 2024 heading into the SEC. So a huge win on Saturday, right, over TC you beating them ensuring you have scoreboard for however long until we play tcu again maybe never right and then on sunday picking up one of the best corners in the country and wardell mack as a future part of this football team can have asked for a better weekend from the texas longhorns right and quinn you were coming back to lead us to victory on saturday all right a quick word from our sponsors then we get into the last segment it's monday so you know the big 12 roundup everything you need to know that happened at your least favorite conference outside of the burnt orange and white Today's episode of Locked on Longhorns is brought to you by Jace Medical. The Jace case provided by Jace Medical provides five life-saving antibiotics for emergency use. All it takes to get a Jace case is to fill out a simple online form and in some cases, jump on a quick call with one of our board certified physicians. Get ongoing care from our physicians on any treatment related questions. Doctor created doctor recommended. Don't get caught unprepared. Everyone should be empowered to care for themselves and their loved ones during the unexpected. Jace handles everything from online evaluations to licensed pharmacy medication delivery and ongoing consultation and care. Jace Medical, this episode is brought to you by Jace Medical and the Jace case. If you are someone you love, would get some peace of mind by having a year supply of any daily medication, then go to jacemedical.com to see if it's offered for you. Remember to use promo code locked on for $20 off your purchase. All right, it's time for the Big 12 Roundup. Everything you need to know to happen in your least favorite conference outside of the University of Texas, although you may have caught up to it uh, this past Saturday, having to wait all day for Texas to play, right? I think that was the first time Texas played a night game since Alabama, right? So it was definitely a weird experience, right? Having to wait till 6 o'clock to watch Texas play, especially after watching them play at 11 the week before. I was kind of spoiled, right? All right, so Texas Tech beat Kansas 16-13. to 13. Not sure there is a team in the country that has had worse injury luck at the quarterback position than Kansas, especially the way that things look right now. You would have to feel like Kansas would be a legitimate Big 12 championship contender, if not already a lot to be in the game if Jalen Daniels didn't get hurt, right? And then they had to deal with Jason Bean getting hurt this past Saturday and going to their third string quarterback against Texas Tech. Texas Tech was up 13 to zero in this game. Kansas, in a heroic effort in the fourth quarter, scored 13 unanswered points to tie it just for Texas Tech to score the game when it field goal 25 seconds later. So, um, like I said, you know, you have to slap a big what if on this season for the Kansas Jayhawks 2023. Uh, certainly, you know, you would have to think they would have had a better season if they would have had if they would have had Jalen Daniels or hell at this point, Jason Bean available for the entire season. Baylor 25, Kansas State 59. It is hard to score 59 points in a in a conference game. It's hard to score 59 points in a football game, period. Uh, as far as the Baylor side, Baylor fans have seen enough of David Randa, right? They're talking about getting him fired right now so they can get ahead of the Michigan State and Texas A&M coaching searches. Um, and Kansas State got back to being one of the best offenses in the country since they lost to uh, Oklahoma State. And even last week, you know, in losing to Texas, they still scored 30 points, but they came back with 59 um, points this week, got back to being one of the best rushing offenses in the country. Will Howard threw three passing touchdowns. Avery Johnson, who was not utilized against Texas is all, threw a passing touchdown as well, and they just routed Baylor. And now, which we'll talk about next, because Oklahoma State absolutely folded, Kansas State's Big 12 championship hopes are still alive, right? Oklahoma State completely folded against UCF after beating Oklahoma, after winning one of the biggest games in the season in college football period, after getting a turtle scoreboard in Bedlam, right, and almost damn near punching your ticket to the Big 12 championship game after beating Oklahoma at home. 
Oklahoma State decided that, you know, that was good enough for them, right? That they had achieved all of their goals and they could just go out and lay down against UCF because that's absolutely what they did, losing 45-3. to John Reese Plumley, my favorite quarterback in college football that doesn't wear a Texas jersey because he plays baseball, he had three touchdowns. Their running back rushed for over 200 yards. Their, uh, one of their receivers had three touchdowns. It was just a mauling, right? 45-3, to it was bad. And now, because Oklahoma State, even though they have – the head-to-head -head over Kansas State and Oklahoma, because they do not play Texas, this opens up a chance for Kansas State and Oklahoma to still get in the Big 12 championship game. So this is just a completely inexcusable bad loss by Oklahoma State against UCF, but this is the same Oklahoma State team that lost by 26 points to South Alabama at home. And I've been screaming it all year because you are not capable of losing a game like that to South Alabama and not slipping up at some point later on in the season. They had mostly avoided it up until now, but Oklahoma State, they are who we thought they were losing by 42 points to UCF on the road, right? West Virginia and Oklahoma, Oklahoma got back on track 59 to 20. If they had not lost two games in a row to inferior opponents in Kansas and Oklahoma State, then we would call this a Heisman moment for Dylan Gabriel, who had eight touchdowns, five passing, uh, three rushing on Saturday. The Oklahoma offense was just dominant. Drake Stoops was dominant on Saturday, and they beat West Virginia by almost 40 points at home. Unfortunately for them, it might not matter because of those two bad losses to Oklahoma State and Kansas. Cincinnati beat Houston 24 to 14. I want to take this moment and not talk about football. It was their homecoming. I live in Houston and the community was definitely shaken up. Uh, there were three, I believe, Cougar, Houston Cougar, former football players that passed away the morning of this game on Saturday, the day of the tailgate um, in a car crash on Fannin in downtown Houston. So um, just a tough, uh, you know, day and weekend for Houston Cougar fans and alumni. Um, definitely a tough day for the team when three of uh, your former players uh, pass away, you know, hours before the homecoming game. So, um, you know, Cincinnati won this game, but, you know, definitely, you know, just a tough day for the community, a tough day for the University of Houston and a tough day for their football team and prayers to everybody involved. And then Iowa State beating up um, BYU 45 to 13. Um, they were really efficient on offense. Their quarterback, uh, you know, threw for two touchdowns and 200 yards. They also rushed for 234 yards and almost seven yards a carry, which allowed them to put up 45 points on BYU. We know that uh, the new Big 12 teams have not had a good track record against the old Big 12 teams. A lot of people are nervous about Texas going to Ames, Iowa on Saturday night to face off against Iowa State. I will say that based on what we've seen from this Texas run defense, I do not imagine that Iowa State will be able to score 45 points or rush for almost 250 yards on seven yards a pop, but should be a very interesting matchup this Saturday against Iowa State. Thank you for tuning in to another episode of Locked On Longhorns, part of the Locked On Podcast Network, your team every day. will continue the conversation this week about Iowa State, Texas and Big 12 championship hopes and Texas college football playoff hopes, which they'll have to achieve for the rest of the year without Jonathan Brooks, who was on his way to winning the Doak Walker Award. So sad that he tore his ACL, but we'll continue the coverage for the Texas football team all week. Hook him and peace.